Today we're going to do science fiction. We're going to talk about telepathy. This is a really common ability in science fiction, someone that can read someone else's mind. And obviously it would be really useful, but I feel that science fiction authors haven't figured out all the ramifications of what would happen if there was a being, an entity that had actually evolved over time to be a telepath. So let's talk about this. Would it just be a person that could read your mind? I don't think so. Uh, if you've seen David Cronenberg's movie Scanners, he defines telepathy in that film as essentially been able to connect up nervous systems at a distance. I think that's pretty accurate. So as a telepath, if you can read their mind, there's nothing to, and put messages to that mind, there's nothing really preventing you from trying to control that other person, giving them instructions. Now, someone intelligent, like a human, might be able to fight back and limit your control. But you don't have to limit it to humans. Lower animals, seems like they'd be pretty easy to control. So for example, you could control, instead of a human, you control a wolf pack, you know, or a cat, or a sw high, swarm of hornets, pretty simply. Just get all these things under control, send them out, do your will. Now you have a really fearsome tool. And over time, you would evolve to be able to do this more effectively. You'd become better and better at doing this. Let me give you the example of coevolution and species control on Earth. Now, it doesn't use telepathy, but the principle is similar. We are going to talk about the thornicacea as an example of coevolution and species control. In Africa, there is a plant, a tree, called the thornicacea. It has large thorns, which don't really protect it at all against browsing animals or insects. You know, I mean, an aphid or a caterpillar doesn't care if you have thorns, and most browsing animals are able to avoid, avoid the thorns. But the thornicacea, if you walk through the savannah, you see one, you'll notice that its leaves aren't all eaten up by insects or browsing animals, looks pretty intact. What's the deal? Well, here's the deal. The thornicacea has large hollow thorns and little nectaries at the base of the thorns. Their nectary is an organ on the plant that produces a, a, a little fruiting body or nectar that is edible, okay? It's not tasty, humans don't harvest it, but it's really good for ants. And there is a biting, stinging ant, very aggressive ant, that loves the thornicaceas. They live inside the hollow thorns. They, hollow, they live inside the thorns, that's their nest. They eat the nectaries, they live on the tree, and they protect it from all comers. If a caterpillar lands on the tree, the ants swarm and sting it to death. If, an ant, if a cow comes up and takes a bite out of it, the ants swarm over the cow, and the cow learns pretty quick, don't eat those trees. They have biting ants on them. So these ants, protect the tree, and they're in effect suborned by the tree to be its defense mechanism. Yeah, sure, it has to evolve, it has to provide them with little fruiting bodies for food, but that's trivial. I mean, how much do ants eat, really? So the tree is in effect controlling the ants to be its defense system. Now, if a mere plant can evolve to do this, you can imagine an intelligent creature that could do it with telepathy, what it could evolve to control its animal life and do things for it. Not only could you control other species, perhaps, but what about your own species? Other species might eventually evolve to be resistant to your control. If, you, if you're constantly using hornets to do your dirty work for you, maybe the hornets will start evolving so that they were no longer so easy to take over. But there's something you could have that wouldn't be able to resist you. And it's very simple. It would be your own children. Imagine a species that had two types of children. One type is the regular type that carries on the species, little duplicates of yourself, like humans have to go off, well not duplicates, but you know, to go off and carry on the species. But then you have another type, a caste, maybe they're subintelligent, they're especially, they're especially strong or tough, they don't breed, their function is to literally be controlled by you. They are your worker caste. Either that, or you could evolve other animals if hornets are trying to be resistant, you evolve the domestic hornets. They're not resistant, they do what you say. So either you could have your own worker cast that you evolved as your own children, or you could have uh, other creatures you've evolved to do it. And so let's call these things, these worker casts that you've evolved to work for you, a broodling, for lack of a better name. Now, I'm not just positing an imaginary, well, I am positing an imaginary thing, but I'm not just trying to like 
go down one little rabbit hole. This seems to me the logical way that telepaths would evolve. They would want to have multiple things working for them. They'd use telepathy for the regular communication thing at a distance to talk to people, but they have all these things to work for them and do things for them and take care of them. Now, what does this mean? Well, these worker drones are kind of like, there's beings in another of David Cronenberg's movies, The Brood, where there's entities that are created that are a little bit like these worker drones. Uh, they aren't controlled by telepathy, but you know, it's a great movie, go watch it, you'll see those things in it. And the idea is that you have these beings that are doing all your work. They can groom you, they can bathe you, they can bring you food, they can fight for you, they can carry messages for you. They do all the work. What do you do? Well, you know, your organs and limbs, your body is kind of a liability to you. What you need to do is evolve to have more and more whatever organ it is that runs the telepathy, probably your brain, a bigger and bigger telepathy organ, a bigger brain, less, you don't need legs. If you need to go somewhere, the broodlings can carry you. You don't need arms. If you need to be able to something, the broodlings can do it for you. You just need to be safe. So probably you're gonna have some kind of lair where you ensconce yourself, you know, underground or in a bunker or something, and the broodlings do all the work. So now we're getting somewhere. Do we need eyes? I don't think so. What is there to look at inside the bunker? Besides, you can look through the broodling's eyes. Do you need ears, any kind of senses? Maybe touch so you can tell if you're feeling sick or something, or if the broodlings are scratching that itch you really want. You don't need many senses. What you end up with as your telepath, if you've evolved down the likeliest path, is you have a giant immobile blob of tissue that sits in an underground bunker and controls other things to do the work for it. I've had my artist draw up a possible way this thing could look, and here it is. I call it the broodmaster. Well, if you're sitting in a bunker and you never move, how do you breed? It's easy. The broodlings carry your zygotes, your genetic information, to another broodmaster somewhere, or maybe not even to the broodmaster, just to one of his broodlings. You spawn a young one. The young one, it's small, it can be easily carried by a broodling, or maybe it's so small it can move on its own. It scuttles off, it finds a little lair, excavates it with its broodlings, starts making its own broodlings, gets bigger, takes over ants or whatever to control more stuff, until finally it's able to join the general society. This doesn't make for much of a family life. You're just spawning these little broodmasters all over the place. My guess is that the adults would view the, um, the children as more of a pest than a kid. I mean, yeah, you have to have some of them around, but they're just everywhere spawning. You know, uh, your broodling's going out bringing you food. You probably kill them without, drop, without thinking about it. There's no family life. There's you, the monstrously selfish thing, sitting alone in your dark lair with your broodlings doing everything. It doesn't have any love. It doesn't have any friends. Its greatest fear is that its lair will be found. All it does is sit there and worry about the things it needs to improve itself. This would naturally tend, I believe, to it being monstrously selfish and greedy. It would view even the other broodmasters just as tools to its end. If they would cooperate, they would work together, but they are not friends the way that humans are. They don't have the same team mentality. And they would view humans too as just another tool to get things for themselves. They would prey upon our weaknesses, probably say, they know what we want because they can read our mind. They would say, hey, I'll give you what you want if you do this for me. It would, be, it would be cronyism carried to the ultimate degree. And of course, it would be really hard to refuse the broodmaster. They're totally unscrupulous and they know everything you want. They can fulfill your every wish, or at least they know what those wishes are, to work towards you. What kind of technology would a broodmaster work for? Well, probably it would focus on things that would increase or enhance or strengthen this telepathic ability. Amplifiers, if you will, for that. It would also probably work on engineering either devices for the broodlings to incorporate them or genetic engineer the broodlings to be more powerful, more effective. Probably will want different casts, maybe small ones to groom it, larger ones to fight, other ones to, to control warships, or not warships, airplanes, or spaceships maybe, right? We're talking about aliens here. And uh, so you have these broodlings, these things sitting in a giant 
technological cell full of amplifiers and devices to enhance its ability to control other things. My guess is that a Broodmaster starship would have one Broodmaster aboard it. Here is my artist's concept of a Broodmaster starship. You can see the central disk of this, and that's where the Broodmaster itself is. All the rest of the ship kind of goes around it, so all the parts are kind of equidistant, so it control them all equally, and they're all covered by the, brood the Broodlings doing all the work. Okay, how would this ship fight? Well, obviously, while the ship could have weapons, it makes sense for the way it to fight by broadcasting its telepathic power to take over enemy ships to fight for it. This is how it functions naturally. You know, if it's being attacked by a pack of wolves, it takes over the wolves to be on its side. If it can't take over all the wolves, it takes over as many as it can and has them fight each other. So, fight enemy ships, it just shuts down your gunner officer or has them start triggering the self-destruct button or something. It's trying to control you. It may have its own weapons as well to give it even more of an edge, but that's probably what it's trying to do. We don't know what the range of a Broodmaster's power is, but remember, the Broodmaster's natural power may only extend for a few miles or a few hundred miles, but with the amplification and the power of a starship, it can probably spread, spread over like light minutes or light hours. An entire solar system can be subject to it, which means that your ship, unless you have some kind of shielding, and I don't even know what kind of shielding you'd use, and plus, if you do have shielding, they've developed all their science as a means to, to enhance their telepathic ability to break through your shields. Your shields have to do a lot of things besides just stop Broodmasters. All they have to do is get through to get you. So they control you. Naturally, you would work on ways to shield yourself. The Broodmaster would keep on working on ways to overcome those shields. And more importantly, it has spies within your network. There's people that it has that it blackmails or bribes or tricks or knows uh, to get to overcome your abilities. And sadly, since the Broodmaster can read your mind, it actually knows what your science is able to do and can figure out ways around it. Uh, it will be an arms race, but an arms race the Broodmaster always has a slight edge in. I'm not saying you can't kill the Broodmasters, obviously you can, uh, but they would be a interesting puzzle for us to posit. If it seems like I've been thinking, doing a lot of thinking about the Broodmaster, I have been. In fact, I started thinking about the Broodmaster 50 years ago as a kid. I tried to work out what a telepath would really be like. Not just a guy that can read your mind, but a guy that can contact you. What would it need? How would it be most effective? What would it evolve into? This is my analysis of what a super telepath would be like, the Broodmaster. Uh, not content just to sit and analyze it in a void, I've actually worked on an upcoming space strategy game called Hyperspace. And since I had the Broodmaster already thought up, I put him into it. So you can be the Broodmasters in the game, try them out, see what you think. And that is our science fiction essay for today.